Okay, so hopefully all of you just saw a little thing pop up that said I am now recording. So uh, for, for those folks who didn't make it to the start of this class, my apologies, I forgot to start recording. You haven't missed anything major yet. We are just getting into uh, assignment deadlines. Um, and uh, okay, are the assignments through the textbook or will they just be posted? Yeah, so I'm getting, I'm just, just getting to that. Um, so we have six in total. Uh, you have one week to complete them. These are due on Fridays at midnight. Um, and here are the dates for these uh, deadlines. And so we have three of them due before reading week and three of them due after reading week. Um, these are going to be based on um, online um, when you look through your text, there is, for those of you using the e-textbook, you can click on sort of online data analysis um, activities. Uh, no, they will not be timed. You'll have a week to do them. Um, data analysis activities, and you can look at the, the, the um, assignment that I based these off of, but I've modified them. Um, and so I will be providing a, a Word document. So I'll be providing an assignment or a PDF, I should say, on my learning space. And there will be an associated um, um, quiz, you know, one of the my learning space polls, basically, for you to put your answers into. So um, the, uh, the assignment will have basically a little background for some data. So all of these are going to be really data driven. The goal of these assignments from my perspective is to um, have you guys working with some really simple data sets, putting these data sets into Excel, doing some really simple visualization. So nothing too fancy, but I found that when I got to, so I, I have taught global ecology and biogeography, which is now called something else for quite a number of years. And um, I found that students were getting to me and, um, okay, I'm enabling, hang on, I'm getting, oh gosh, mouse issues. Uh, um, okay, back to the assignments. So the goal of these assignments is to get you guys working with numbers. And so taking some data from um, these, these online data activities that are all biologically focused, um, getting those numbers into Excel, doing some basic data visualization, um, and answering some questions based on those graphs that you will produce, okay? Um, and so, so all of these are linked with chapters in your textbook, and so you'll be able to, there will be some um, readings that happen in conjunction with, uh, with those, those data, um, those data exercises, all of that will be in the assignment that I post. There's some supplementary stuff in the text, and I believe that is the same for the fourth and fifth edition texts. So do, for those fourth edition folks, the things that you're missing out on are the online pieces. Um, okay. Great. Sorry, I, I, we do have IAs for the course. I have not yet connected with them because that's sort of still getting sorted out. So we do not have um, a, a chat monitor. So I'm kind of doing that myself right now. So excuse my um, sort of broken nature here. Well, we need to know how Excel works from scratch or will we have a template to fill in answers? Um, I was going to go through just a really simple um, example um, from the, well, from, to, to sort of, uh, in, in, in this class, go through kind of putting data into Excel, things that you want to think about when you're, when you're entering your data, um, and how to create simple graphs. So you're not going to have to be using any fancy Excel functions. Um, there's lots of things that Excel can do, but we're really just going to be using it for data visualization in these questions um, or in these assignments. And so I was going to show you a little bit about that today. Um, but what I was also going to do was post this week's assignment tomorrow, or sorry, post the assignment due in two weeks time. So it's due on January 21st. I was going to post it tomorrow. So you have two weeks to work on it. And then if anyone has any questions about that assignment, you can either come to student hours on Tuesday 
or you can, you can, we can go through some of that on Thursday to make sure people are on the right track in terms of um, how to do this. And so, so yeah, the, the learning objective here is to get you guys working with, um, working with numbers, visualizing data and kind of getting comfortable with doing that. And they're really simple data sets. So you don't need to, um, you don't need to be an expert at Excel, but just getting everyone comfortable with this. Okay, um, any questions about that? And you can feel free to turn your mic on if you have questions about this particular assignment. Um, the answers will all just be posted through a poll on my learning space. And so um, there will be two, for each assignment, there will be two pieces. There will be the PDF assignment, and then there will be the, uh, the poll that you actually put your answers in once you have that figured out. And I would suggest, um, because, because you're not actually going to be submitting graphs to me, because you're not going to be submitting your entered data, save those files. And then if you end up having a question that you've gone wrong on and you want to know why, then you and I can take a look at that together and I can help you work through that so you don't make the same mistake the next time. Um, so don't toss those files, even if... Um, even though you don't have to submit those graphs to me. Uh, will the exercise show up on the midterm? No, we won't. I won't be asking you questions from that exercise in the midterm, but the kinds of ideas, the kinds of sort of data interpretation that you'll be doing with these assignments are the types of questions I really like to give on midterms. And so you having to take a look at a graph and interpret and answer questions from that graph. And so, um, so hopefully, Robia, that answers your question. Okay, any other, any other questions about this assignment? All right. So back to this window. So the second assignment is this minute ecology assignment. And I am just gonna play a short video. I don't know if any of you had a chance to look at Minute Earth. Um, there's all kinds of other really super cool um, kind of science communication uh, short videos that, that have been put together. And, and you can use your favorite one of those as, as your exemplar for how you might like to do this. Uh, I see, yes, it was a good short video. I'm going to play one of, so my kids love watching these and they're so excited that you, that you folks are going to be doing this assignment. They, they're, um, they're keen to watch all of them and sit down and learn all of the things that you guys are going to put together, um, for this assignment. Oh, I see. Hi, just a quick question. The assignment data comes from the online textbook. No, I will be putting the data into the um, document that will be on my learning space. And so there will be a table with numbers and you're going to have to put it into a configuration that allows you to graph it. And that's what I'm going to be after we go through this minute ecology assignment. That's what I'm going to be sort of getting into to show you a little bit about, you know, some some good practices for putting data together when you want to think about plotting X and Y variables. Um, so to access it, no, you, no, to access it, you do not need to be enrolled in the DTA program. Um, okay. Any other questions about that? All right. So we'll just really quickly watch this video. This is my, my kid's favorite one from Minute Earth. Um, we use this to supplement some of their science last year when, uh, they were not learning, or I guess not last year. God, it's been two years now. It's in 2020, when they didn't have any teaching happening at all. I'm there. About to there okay, so hang on. We... There we go. Hi, this is Can you see it now? Sometimes a hamster mom yes. looks at her adorable little babies and is like, I just want to gobble you up. Except not in a cute way. Can Maroon you hear like it? A, I'm actually about to eat you. Kind of way. And hamster moms That's aren't perfect. Around. Pigs, bugs, birds, snakes, primates, and fish all occasionally nom on the next generation, which is weird. Not just because we humans consider it deeply wrong to eat our own babies, but also because making babies is the primary goal of virtually all life. So eating them and the genes they carry seems like the ultimate act of self-defeat. But self-defeating impulses have a pretty straightforward way of dying out. So the fact that species across the animal kingdom occasionally cannibalize their young suggests that it can sometimes be a successful strategy. 
For instance, hamsters appear to use baby eating as a form of crowd control. Females with litters of eight or nine pups eat two of them on average. And when scientists have tried adding a couple pups to the litter, the hamster moms eat four. But removing a few of the pups the day they're born pretty much stops the cannibalism before it starts. Suggesting that a hamster mom might eat her young to keep her litter small enough that she can provide for the survivors and ensure they grow up to pass on their genes. Other critters, like the long-tailed sun skink, chow down on their babies only in emergencies. When predators repeatedly threaten to eat the mother's eggs, she beats them to it and eats them all herself. Which actually makes sense. If the eggs are doomed to become someone's lunch, making them her lunch helps prepare the mama skink for another round of reproduction. And sometimes kids, you know, get in the way, so they just have to go. The male sand goby fertilizes eggs from multiple females over a short period of time and cares for them all together in one nest. In order to mate again, he has to wait for all his eggs to hatch. So he sacrifices the slow pokes to free himself up for more baby making. In short, for critters across the animal kingdom to maximize the resources, energy, and opportunities they need to pass on their genes, sometimes it does make sense to order off the kids menu. Just okay. Now I'm going to stop sharing that and go back to my PowerPoint. So, okay. Gosh, I will say this is a lot easier when I'm in class. Um, okay, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint presentation again. Um, so yeah, that's my that's one of my kids' favorite um, favorite Minute Earth videos. But you can see just really you know really interesting you know a really interesting topic, a pretty small topic, and um, what they've done is pulled together a lot of information with different examples and communicated it in a really plain language way. Um, and so that is kind of what kind of what we're going to do for this assignment. And so this is due March 11th. Um, and what I'm going to ask you to do is get into groups of two or three. If you don't know anyone in the class and want to be paired up, um, I can help facilitate that. Uh, but um, what I want you to do is identify an ecological topic that is that that you and your group find exciting or interesting or weird or whatever it happens to be that is is the driver for for you wanting to look into this. And um, by January 31st, so the end of this month, what I'd like to have happen is to have you and your group send me the, the names of your group and your topic by, um, well, as soon as possible, but no later than January 31st. And then conduct the research. So figure out the story that you want to tell with this, um, figure out what's going on in the particular question you're asking, create a story that you're going to tell um, that is based on, you know, scientific knowledge, ecological knowledge, and then create a digital story. And this, this can be done by using lots of different formats. Um, I'm sure that all of you have, have much matter skills with uh, all kinds of different ways of communicating um, science or communicating to the general public than I do, but um, there's there's all kinds of tools. If you need suggestions for different tools to use, I'm happy to provide suggestions. Um, it can be as simple as you know doing a voiceover with with images or demonstrations or whatever it happens to be in you know in something like. Um, um, you know, a recorded PowerPoint, or if you're, if you use TikTok, I know that that can record videos and you could figure out how to do it using that. Um, there's a program called Canva that you can make short videos in. So there's all kinds of tools out there um, that are free that you can, that you can use to, to do this. And you can, you have creative freedom for putting these together. Um, I will be providing a rubric. I have not created that rubric yet, but I will. Um, well before January 31st. And um, yeah, so then you're going to create this digital story that's three to five minutes long. So about the length of what we just viewed. Um, if you're, yeah, if you're creative and can draw, that can be a great way to do that. You can also, you know, use any, use any sort of media that you think is appropriate for putting it together. Um, 
yeah, and that's that's about that on that assignment. Um, these will be I will be watching all of these and grading them, and my kids will be watching them with me. Um, and yeah, I'm seeing lots and lots of chat here. So hopefully I'm not missing anything. Would you be able to choose the groups for us? Seems like we won't know anyone. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I am very happy to assign groups. So maybe if if you have a group that you'd like to work with, if you do know people, I know it's really hard for you guys to, to know anyone because you haven't actually been in-person classes together. So um, this was the other reason I thought this was a good a good thing to do in a in a group framework because it actually lets you kind of meet a few people, um, even though it will be virtual meetings. Uh, so if you maybe maybe I'm from from the chat here, I'm seeing some people want to make their own groups. Some people uh, don't want to make their own group. So maybe if you. OK, lo yeah, lots of people who have groups. Um, OK, so if you have a group, maybe send it to me sooner than later, and then I will then I will reach out to those of you who don't have a group and um, help facilitate that. Yeah, I, that's probably the best way to do that. Um, I did see that, uh, oh, that's a great idea. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Iwan, I hope that's the way you say your name. Um, I will make I will make groups on my learning space. I'll figure out how to do that. And you can join an empty group. Uh, and yes, and then I can randomize those that happen after a certain date. Super. Okay. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. I will do that. So you guys can keep your eyes peeled for that on my learning space. I'll send a message when that's up and rolling. It'll take me a little bit to figure that out because I've never done that before. Um, in terms of working independently, I... I, I, I would ask that you actually work in groups. This is a, this is a group project. Um, and so, so independent work on this is not going to be something that I can, that I can accommodate. So, um, yeah, so there's lots of groups that already seem to be popping up in the chat and, um, you can feel free to throw your name in the hat for any of those. Okay. Any further questions about that assignment? Can we work in partners? I don't know the number of students in the class right now. Um, it is growing on a daily basis. Um, and so it may be the case that some groups have to be two and some groups have to be three. Uh, so, so we'll kind of see how that all falls out numbers wise. Um, the other thing, just in terms of the class size growing, um, I did want to pass this information along. There's, you know, we will know. I've been told that we will know by ideally before um, the drop date whether whether class will be um, what's going to be happening with our classes. So I I know as little as you do in terms of whether we're going to be moving to um, back to in person, whether we're, we're going to be staying online. Um, and I know for some of you that might influence your decision as to whether you can stick with the course or not. Um, so I'm hoping to have more information on that to you, you know, very soon that the, the folks who are making those decisions are making them are having regular meetings. Uh, I would be, yeah, that's, uh, that's all, um, I have to say about that. Did anyone make a group chat for this class, by the way? So there is a discussion group on my learning space. Um, and you, yeah, I've I've started a couple topics, but feel free to add topics to that um, and um, add threads to that. So uh, there may be, okay. Okay, great. Anything else on here on this topic? No. Okay. So I'm just going to move on to this next little 
um, thing, uh, just a very short Excel tutorial. And I'm happy to expand on this depending, I didn't know how familiar all of you would be with Excel. So I actually put together a little poll. Hopefully this works. If you guys could answer these questions, then I can, um, looks like everyone has used Excel or most people have, oh no, okay. Oh, wow, we've got 192 people on today. Hi, everybody. This is the biggest class I've taught. So um, what was the due date for the assignment again? The Minute Earth assignment or the Minute Ecology assignment? I think I had on that slide um, uh, March 11th. And I will also be popping those, um, those dates into the class calendar. I've been populating the class calendar with you know, meeting times and tutorial times and meet the scientist times. Um, and I will also put all of the assignments into the, um, into the class um, calendar. Okay, so this is great. It looks like the vast majority of you have used Excel. Um, and, and most of those of you have, have entered data in Excel. Um, and then, yeah, most of you have also, yeah, we're getting between, you know, 85 and 96% and of you who have created graphs, entered data and used Excel. So that's, that's great. So many of you are familiar with this. For those of you who have no experience using Excel, I am very happy to get together with you one-on-one -on -one and help if you need that. Okay. So yeah, there's there's the results from our from our poll. Um, so lots of lots of seasoned Excel users in the group. Okay, great. Um, so the one part of the assignment, the first online data assignment that you're going to be, um, uh, oh great, lab inst instructors helped you with this. So one, one of, in the first assignment, the first online data assignment that you're going to be working with, um, so next week we're starting a section on the physical environment on, on the biosphere and we're going to be learning all kinds of things about climate. We're going to be learning all kinds of things about how climate impacts where biomes are distributed on the planet. And one of the things that is used quite extensively when we're thinking about different biomes is um, these climate diagrams. Um, and a climate diagram basically is this, is this kind of graph where you've got month on the x-axis. So G January, February, March, et cetera, et cetera. You've got temperature on one of the y-axis and you have precipitation on the other y-axis. So I wanted to show this example because it's a little bit more complicated than just making a simple xy graph. Many of the graphs that you'll have to make will just be simple xy graphs where you only have one at y axis and one x axis. And that makes it pretty straightforward um, to insert a chart into your Excel spreadsheet. Um, it's a little bit less intuitive when you are making a, a, a graph with two axes. But the way you read this kind of graph, it gives us all kinds of information. We'll be learning about these um, in the second lecture next week. Uh, and um, what the, one of the key points of these is that um, it's, it's, it's setting up the axes so that one degree Celsius is equivalent to two millimeters of precipitation. And the reason this is important is because that is the point at which if, if, if you have uh, um, precipitation that, ex so, th so that, that allows the temperature and the precipitation to be aligned in such a way that if you have um, precipita uh, precipitation exceeding the, the temperature curve, then you have sufficient precipitation to support plant growth and productivity. If your precipitation line, this blue line is falling down below your temperature line, it means you don't have enough precipitation to support um, 
to support plant productivity. And this has to do with the evapotranspirative losses from the system. So we have evaporation, we have transpiration. When it's, when it's too warm, when you have very high hot temperatures and very limited precipitation, we know that drives drought. And so these times where there's low precipitation, but high temperatures, um, uh, you end up with periods where plants don't have enough water. And so this is what these climate diagrams give us a lot of information about. Okay, so in this graph, we have a blue line that corresponds with precipitation. We have a red line that corresponds with temperature. And the graphs you're gonna be making are not gonna have these fancy colors and dashes and, and all of this stuff, but this is basically gonna be what you're going to try to create in this, in this assignment. You're gonna be creating your own um, climate diagrams. Okay, any questions? I'm seeing uh, a few questions about class size. Yeah, I guess in the syllabus I said three to four. Um, so let's, yeah, let's stick with that. Um, since I put that in the syllabus, um, let's, let's stick with groups of three to four. Okay, any questions about this climate diagram? We will be learning these in the context of biomes and going through a number of them, but I just wanted to show you what this graph looks like. So when we go to the Excel spreadsheet, that you will have a good handle on what what we're looking what we're looking at. Okay, so we're going to be working with some data, and the, this data table is the exact data table that's going to be in the assignment that I'm going to post tomorrow. Okay, and so this gives us average monthly temperature in degrees Celsius, average monthly pre precipitation in millimeters for three different locations. And you have the, the, um, uh, the latitude of these uh, locations and the altitude here. That's not really gonna be relevant for our particular assignment. Um, we have three locations, Zaragoza, Big Lake, and Spur. And we have um, mean monthly temperature and precipitation for each of these. Okay, so those are the, this is the data table you're gonna see in the assignment. There will actually be two data tables. Um, one of the data tables, this is this is it. And so I'm going to now move, I'm going to stop sharing this and start sharing my um, Excel spreadsheet. Hopefully you can see that. And so in this Excel spreadsheet, I have entered all of those data that were in that table. And the first thing to note, my screen sharing is paused. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes, I'm seeing the graph. Oh, great. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so the way I've entered this here, and this is a really important thing to think about when you're working with data, is how are you going to enter the data so it makes sense so you can actually graph it? Um, and so typically, th this is a very typical way to enter it. So if you recall, we had in that, in that file we were just looking at, there was month that went along basically along um, columns. So you had precipitation, temperature, precipitation, temperature, precipitation, temperature for months going across the columns, but that makes it really hard to graph. And so when you're entering these data from that table into the Excel spreadsheet, you know, this is, this is a typical way to enter variables where you have, um, you know, if you're just talking about a single XY variable where you have them in their own columns, so temperature and precipitation, and you enter those values for each of those months um, vertically as opposed to horizontally, which is how it was in that um, in that data table. So when we do that, we have month and we have temperature for Zaragoza, temperature for Big Lake, I think it was called, and temperature for Spur. And so what you're going to have to do in the assignment, um, one of the things you're going to have to do in the assignment is to plot up, make a make a graph like this for each of those locations. And there's going to be one question about each of those graphs. These assignments are not long. This assignment has five questions. You have to make um, five different graphs and answer a question about each of those graphs. And so these assignments, I think, should not take you probably more than, um, depending on how fast you are at entering data and things like that, probably shouldn't take you more than an hour. Um, okay, so you can see that I've already plotted one of these up, the one for Zaragoza. And for whatever reason, it turned my months into numbers, but that's fine because we know that month number one is, is um, uh, January and month number, that's kind of done something funny there. Um, 
Yeah, it's kind of done something funny there. I'm not exactly sure what's happened there. Uh, so I'll have to have to figure that out. But I wanted to show you the way to get these two axes. You can there's I guess there's two ways to do it. You can plot two separate graphs and overlay them and make sure the scales are are lined up the way you want them to. And that's one thing. If you recall, we have this um, requirement that one degree Celsius equals two millimeters of precipitation. And so you can see here, this is my, I don't have these labeled, that's, that's bad form on my part, but this is our temperature axis. This is our precipitation axis. So you can see, and an easy way to make sure that you have one degree Celsius corresponding to two millimeters precipitation is your top number of your temperatures is half that of your precipitation. And then the shape, the, the alignment of your curves will be such that you can evaluate those time periods when there's not enough precipitation to maintain plant growth. So in this case, in the Zaragoza one, we see that there are um, fairly large periods of the year where there's not enough precipitation to maintain um, plant productivity. And then a few times in the year, we've got this little, this little peak of precipitation here and this little peak of precipitation here where there is um, sufficient precipitation to um, support plant growth and productivity. Okay, so this is the kind of graph you want to do. The way I did that, um, I'm just going to do it again. I highlighted these, so I entered my data. I highlighted these three columns, and so this is our, if you recall, if you take a look at this, this is our x, our x-axis or our predictor variable. Um, oh, I see someone's hand is raised. Caitlin, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I don't. We can't see what you're doing right now because your screen's paused. Oh, so, I like had if you're moving if your you mouse, you guys could stuff, see yeah, the can. share. We can see the screen, computer. but like whatever you're doing now with highlighting and stuff, we can't see it. Oh. Yeah, so you just have to like restart. Oh, your got share. it. Okay. Can you guys see what I'm doing now? Yeah. Sorry about that. You see that I'm highlighting. Okay. I'm just going to assume that everyone can see that I'm highlighting stuff. So here's our X variable, our predictor variable. So month, we know that we have, you know, seasonal variation and precipitation and temperature through the months. And then we have our two response variables, temperature and precipitation for Zaragoza. And we could do the same thing for Big Lake. We could do the same thing for um, Spur was the name of the other one. Okay. So to make that little graph, I just highlighted those three columns and then you go to the insert uh, tab and, um, oh gosh, how did I do this? And that did not work. Okay, hang on. Um, oh, I just did this like a few minutes ago. Um, do, 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 recommended charts. Nope. Uh, oh, I know what it is. Here we go. Uh, combo. So right. It was over here. Recommended charts. This, this may look a little bit different on a PC. I use a Mac. So this is what your, uh, um, your insert, um, bar will look like for a Mac and it may look a little bit different for a PC, but in this combo one, you can select this, which you can see has um, a line, you know, a secondary axis line. And so we can press that um, and it creates this bar chart, which you can leave it, you can leave it at that if, if you're happy with that, um, because you can still get the same information. You can see that, uh, so this is temperature, the blue, the blue bars are temperature, the orange lines are precipitation, and we've got precipitation over here on the second y-axis and temperature over here on the first y-axis. Um, if you recall, we do need to get this though, so 35 is not half of 90, and so we have to get these axes so that the precipitation is double, the value of the precipitation is double that of the temperature. So we can actually make that comparison of, you know, evapotranspirative loss to precipitation inputs, okay? So you can change the value on these. So if you press control and click on your axis, you can format your axis and you can change your minimum and maximum. And so I've already done this. So I'm gonna change this to 50. You can leave it at zero because they both start at zero. I'm gonna change this to 50 and 
press enter, that fixes that. And then we do the same thing for the second axis. So we format the axis, we change this to 100. And all of a sudden, we now have a graph that, that looks very similar to this, um, to this one that I made with lines. So you can either leave it as a chart like this, um, or you can change it to a line, which seemed to do something funny there. So, um, but the way you the way you change these bars to a line is uh, just well, you can add a tread line. What without no, that's not what we want to do. Um, we want to change this to um, to that, and that didn't put it in the right spot. Oh, it changed my axis again. Okay, so then we format our axis again. We put this at 50. And now we have this, this same graph, okay? So for Zaragoza. And so again, um, that, so, so that I just wanted to kind of walk through how to do those two, like those, those graphs that have two axes, because that's a little bit, a little bit trickier um, than, than your normal, like if we just wanted to plot temperature and precipitation, all we do would be, you know, do that kind of, oh, that did not work at all. Wow, okay. Oh, no, it did because it's continuous. Anyway, that's a funny way to look at it. But, or if we just wanted to plot temperature by month, we would just um, go to insert, um, insert a chart, and we get this temperature curve by month. And that makes it, you know, pretty, pretty easy to do. It's adding that second, that second one that's a little bit trickier. And it, the way, the way we do that is by going to, um, these combo graphs. Okay, any questions about that? I've been talking and not monitoring the chat. It's, um, I see there's 60 things in the chat, but I have a feeling that a lot of it is chatter between you guys, which is great. Um, a lot of, I need a group. Um, if anyone put anything that is not about groups, what are the, what are all the other columns for? Oh, the temp BL and the precipitation BL. Those are for, oh, then never mind, laugh out loud. Okay, cool. Um, but I will just explain that in case anyone else missed that. These are just the temperatures and the precipitation um, for other places. And so we could do this and make the one for BL. And I'll just do that. Um, I'll delete this repeat Zaragoza one. And we'll make the repeat one for, uh, for Big Lake, I think it's called. And so we see the same thing here. Um, we can change this to, how did I do that last time? It was in insert. We can change this to a graph line. And then remember, you've got to have your temperature being twice of uh, being half of the, half that of the precipitation. So, so what is happening here? Uh, we're gonna format our axis. We're gonna increase that axis to 50 because you can see that on the y-axis here, it goes from zero to 100. So this y-axis, we want to go from zero to 50. Um, and so what we see in, in this context is that we've got uh, a system where um, precipitation is typically sufficient for the, um, given the temperature. So our blue line is our temperature, our orange line is our precipitation. And so we see lots lots of time in the year where precipitation is almost good enough or exceeding what is necessary for the, um, for the evapotranspirative, evapotranspirative fluxes associated with the system. Okay, any other non, yeah, one degree equals two millimeters, you are correct. No, two millimeters. So when, when we think about rainfall, think about the forecast that you get on your phone or whatever. It says, how much rain are you going to get today? Well, we're going to get five millimeters of rain or whatever it happens to be. That's kind of a gross day, right? So rainfall is actually reported in millimeters and hydrologists use the unit millimeters to talk about all of the water fluxes from a system. Okay. So that is why that is in millimeters, not milliliters. All right, any other questions about how to do this? Again, I'm gonna post that assignment um, tomorrow. So you have two weeks to do the first one. You can come to student hours or to next Thursday's synchronous session and we can 
go through some of this again. If you're like, ah, I can't remember what, what she said and what she's talking about on this Zoom recording doesn't make any sense. Um, we can do that too. So uh, I'm very happy to kind of walk folks through this first one. Um, just wanted to double check that you can have four in a group. Yes, we can have four in a group. Okay, um, I'm gonna, you're welcome. I'm gonna stop sharing this. I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint presentation. And that's that's actually, that was the end of my PowerPoint presentation. Um, I see that, Flynn, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Um, hello, I have a question about the mini ecology assignment. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Does it have to look exactly like the one you showed us? Because I don't know if I have the capabilities to do something. No, 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 like no. no. I, I wouldn't have the capabilities either, Flynn. That's why I said you can you can use your creative freedoms. Right, um, okay. You can if you you can you can use you could use still shots. You could find really great diagrams that work well to demonstrate the uh, uh, the the voiceover that you're planning on using. If that's you know, so so no, I'm not going to evaluate you on your ability to make amazing drawings and turn them into something incredibly appealing visually. I, I want effort to be put into the visual appeal of the product, but it can be. So, you know, when we're doing uh, digital stories for my groups, so we often do really plain language communication for communities that we work with um, or for government partners and we'll make um, digital stories. And a lot of times it's just still shots from different things that we're doing in the field with voiceover. So that's a really simple way of doing it. Um, and that can be done, that can be done really readily with, you know, recording on your phone and having, um, putting that over top of, you know, a PowerPoint presentation or in Canva, as I mentioned, that's a free software that I figured out how to use myself in like five minutes. So there's lots of really easy and I can put it just a little list of tools that that I find easy and accessible. Some of you will have mad drawing skills and go to town, have fun with it. Um, but for those of you who are like me and a stick man is a, is a sorry site, don't feel like you have to create something that looks like um, the cannibalistic hamster example that we used. Um, yeah, Brilliant. thank so. you so much. I didn't want to like under under <laughs> no, no, no. no, the goal here is not to turn all of you virtual <laughs> scientists into artists, but okay, rather to have you thinking about uh, learn thinking and learning about a topic and figuring out how to communicate that really in in very plain terms. That's actually it's a, a really difficult thing to do, and it requires you to kind of develop a, a pretty deep understanding of that topic, and to also pull together the examples that will support the story that you're trying to create in that assignment. So okay, that's, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, that's Thank the you goal so there. Thanks for the question, Flynn. Any other questions about any of this? Um, maybe just have a two person group. Um, I, I'm going to say, Yes to the two-person groups, unless we have solo folks. If there are people who haven't found a group and they need to be in a group, I would pop those into a two-person group. Um, is the textbook required or supplementary? It's required. Uh, we will. I will be following the textbook pretty closely. Um, I have been getting lots of questions about fourth versus fifth edition. I've taken a look through it. Uh, I did have, I actually strangely had a fourth edition copy here. Um, that I guess got mailed to me at some point. And so I, I unwrapped that and took a look and it looks like the figures are by and large the same. The most of the content seems like it's pretty similar. Um, so I, th I think that you would, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna say to use that, but I, it's only four years younger than the current fifth edition books. So it's not as though, you know, ecological theories have changed dramatically since 2017. So um, yes, the e-text, you should have gotten emails already about the e-text and it will pop up in your My Learning Space. Um, and you either have to decide to adopt the e-text or to opt out if you have access to another text. But the text is really gonna be quite critical for, because I will be following it very, very closely. So having, having you know, fourth or fifth edition text is, is pretty important. Um, okay. 
if the university decides, you guys are chatting fast and furious. If the university decides to have the rest of the semester online, will the midterm final require lockdown? I don't totally know what the question is that you're asking there. Um, I, my suspicion given this class size is that we, at, at the very least, the midterm is gonna be um, delivered remotely. Um, I can't see that by February, the numbers are gonna be so much better that, uh, anyway, I'm not gonna speculate on what the situation is gonna be like. Um, I'm not really sure what you mean, uh, Gerald, by, by lockdown. Can you explain that to me? Are you there? I think he means like lockdown browser, like the Respondus thing. Oh, I don't think that that I think that that is not something that. Um, yeah, I don't think that's something is that is being used. Uh, so so I would my plan. My plan is to schedule the midterm during our class time and to have different versions of it that each of you would receive uh, randomly and that you do those that you do the midterms and you'd have an uh, you'd have an allocated time to complete the midterm in but i will not be monitoring that midterm i will be um what i will plan to do is be available on zoom during that time if you have questions about the midterm um or yeah somehow i i guess that's i haven't this is actually my first time teaching a uh, um a, a virtual course so um it 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 is very a really steep learning curve for me so that was kind of my plan, um, giving you guys a, a, a finite period of time to complete the midterm, having having different versions of it that that you guys would that you guys, folks would receive. Um, well, we get a topic list for the group assignment. Um, I was really hoping that you know you would you know take a look through the text or you know, think about something that you're really curious about and decide to jump into that. If people are really struggling to figure out a topic, I'm happy to make suggestions, but I, I, you know, there's so many different things you can explore in the world of ecology. I would like you to pass your, um, your topic by me to make sure that it's, you know, sufficiently focused, that it's something that you can actually talk about in, this short time frame that you have. So you don't want to choose a huge broad topic that you're never going to be able to dive into sufficiently. I want the topic, you know, like the example we just saw of, you know, why would animals eat their young? That's a very focused topic, but they brought in a lot of different examples of how different species of the sort of evolutionary significance of that process for different species. So, you know, being able to give some, get into the nitty gritty of the process you're interested in and then I give some really clear examples of how that works. Um, will the midterm be administered via my learning space regardless of in-person instruction? Yes, I, I think it will be. Um, okay. I see a hand up, Flynn. Oh, sorry. Um, That's all so right. Were no, these, so, were these classes on Thursday? Will they consist of um, like content as well that will be covered on the lectures, or I'm just confused. So, I wanted to leave these. I've, I've had conversations. I, initially, I was thinking, oh, I'll do all of the lectures synchronously, but then I realized that that's really hard for some folks to, um, um, you know, just because of different different realities of of trying to dial in from remotely to classes or even you know i've had days where i'm not able to get on zoom so i decided the best plan was to put all the content into those videos that i'm recording in my basement with my new fancy light um and then um these sessions would be used for this for this purpose so if you know if i'm seeing from the assignments for example the online assignments it that there is a real um deficiency and understanding of a particular topic that suggests that I maybe haven't done a very good job explaining it. And so then, you know, I would use that time to cover off on that. If there's questions coming up in the discussion, so I've created a, a, a class discussion. If there's a lot of questions coming up about certain topics um, as we're going through the course, then I'll use these Thursday slots to, to sort of expand upon 
that content and to help to try to dive a little deeper so people have a better understanding of it. So um, you can either come to class with questions and we can we can flesh those questions out or you can send questions to me by email um, if you don't feel comfortable putting them into the discussion. But I'll be checking that that my learning space discussion, you know, on the, you know, the day before, on Wednesday, the day before these synchronous sessions, or probably actually in the morning, probably Thursday morning of the synchronous sessions, so that I can put together any, any additional material that might be useful for helping improve understanding of um, the content that's been given synchronously. And then I will remember to press record next time, and these, these sessions will be posted as well. Okay, is a syllabus somewhere I'm missing? I sent an email about that. Um, the syllabus, you go into my learning space, you go to content, you go to overview, and it's in the overview section for the course. Um, okay. Okay, I'm just kind of going through this chat. Thanks for all the, you're doing great guys. <laughs> Sorry, I do not have COVID. I just had a little cough. Uh, let's see here. I'm just, can, can you guide us to similar videos? Do you mean similar videos to the Minute Earth videos, Christine? Um, so uh, assuming that Christine meant similar videos to the, um, oh, there you are, Christine, hi. Hi, sorry, yeah, I meant the Minute video. Yeah, so so Minute Earth has a whole bunch of different videos. They're actually really awesome. They're not all on ecological topics, but there's so many great videos. So so go there, a lot of them are really funny too. So um, worth checking that out. Uh, I was, what was I just looking at earlier that was a really great example of, I, I can send you send you guys a few examples of kind of good SciComm videos, um, and I'll try to what I'll try to do is dig in and see what I can find in, that are, that are in different formats because certainly the Minute Earth folks use a you know use the kind of format that we saw in that um, they've got obviously someone who has some good little cartoony drawing skills, um, so so I'll, I'll try to find some other examples of some SciComm that may use, you know, different um, kind of different approaches. So you can see, you know, a range of ways that this can be, this can be done. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, will we be tested on information discussed by the Meet the Scientists? Um, I will probably pull a question or two questions out of those Meet the Scientists. Uh, uh, lectures. Um, my real, you know, the, the bigger goal of those lectures is to um, each of the scientists, each of the researchers that's coming to visit us is, you know, doing a different type of research. So I have them kind of paired to topics that we'll be covering through the course. And they're going to be coming and giving you a real world, world example of research that is being conducted on that topic. Um, the other cool thing about these folks is that um, they're coming from different uh, endpoints in ecology. So um, we've got we've got a couple of academic uh, sci researchers like myself. Uh, we have one visiting scientist from the Canadian Forest Service. We have one visiting scientist who's who works for a non governmental organization. So researchers who are working in very different um, kind of endpoints in in a um, uh, in, in research and conducting all kinds of cool research related to these ecological topics. So it's also an opportunity for you to, you know, ask them questions about how they got to where they got and um, to, see, to see, you know, the, the theories that we're going to be talking about in class applied to real world situations and research. Um, but yeah, there's I think probably from the perspective of, you know, actually asking questions about, you know, a graph that one of them puts up, or it would probably be more so that I might 
you know, take an example of something that they talked about in their presentation and, and have you, you know, answer a question about that figure or, you know, think about, so I, I, what I try to do with testing is not have you memorize information, but rather take that information and apply it to situations. So I'll give you a, you know, I'll, I'll give you a situation and I'll give you guys some practice and questions before the midterm too. Um, but, you know, using using example graphs, using example um, tables, using um, text that describes a situation and having you apply your knowledge of, um, of that particular, not that specific topic, but the more general topic and answer questions based on that. So do I expect you to kind of memorize content from the visiting scientist lectures? No. Might we take some of the ideas that are presented in the visiting scientist lectures and apply them in a different way? That's certainly possible. So that's the way that's the way my testing works. Is you know I'm not it's it's not going to be memorization based, but rather application of that knowledge to um, uh, to examples of things that you may or may not have seen in the past. Okay. Um, okay, that's, I've, I've come to the end of the chat. Was there anything I missed in the chat or that anyone, any burning questions that people have? If not, um, I think we're gonna call it a wrap for today. Uh, I will be, as I mentioned, I'll be posting the first assignment tomorrow. Uh, I will have our next lecture posted by Monday at the latest, hopefully tomorrow. I've got a recording day tomorrow. Uh, so, so we'll have new content on the physical environment and then on the biosphere. Um, uh, starting next week. Will the slides that I go through on Thursdays be posted prior to lecture in the future? Uh, probably. Probably not because those those will be kind of created on the fly, Alessandra. Um, because what I'm going to do is build build that content for those Thursday sessions based on questions in the discussion or questions I receive via email. Um, so the likelihood that I'll be able to get those posted in advance, but I can try um, if I've got them if I've got them all ready by five o'clock, I'll throw them up on on my learning space. That's that's not a big deal. Um, and will our midterm be during class time? Yes, it will. Um, yeah. Okay. And I think, I think with that, we will, we'll call it a day. Um, if there's any questions that you haven't had answered today, uh, again, feel free to send me an email. Um, please, it, it would be ideal if you use my, um, my learning space, um, email address and then that lets me help that helps me to keep my course emails all concentrated in one place will I be posting the slides afterward yeah so the slides from week one are already posted I'll pop these slides into the same um the same folder so there will be a second set of powerpoint slides in the week one um section of of our course content and so each week I'll post the the powerpoint slides for each of the um, each of the lectures and um, any additional material that we cover on Thursdays. Uh, field courses, these are good questions to ask Dr. Costilla. All right. Um, okay. Thanks everybody. Um, thanks for all the great questions and engagement. This is a, hopefully this is a good format for everyone. But again, I'm, I'm certainly keen to hear your perspectives on how, how this is all going. Um, and we can, we can revamp and, and modify as we move through if there's something that is just not, uh, not gelling for everybody. So um, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Stay well. Um, I hear they're giving out rapid tests at Lazaridis Hall, I think, tomorrow as well. So. If anyone's in need of those, get in line early. I'm sure that they will go fast. Okay, take care, everybody. Um, 
I'll see you. I'll see you next week. And remember, we have student hours on Tuesday if there's any any questions or concerns you have. Okay. Bye.